All right, today we have the tremendous pleasure of being joined by Xavier and Rice University alum and current Los Angeles Laker combo guard, Quincy Olivari. Quincy, welcome to the Lakers Legacy Podcast. Thanks for hopping on. How has your August been going as you gear up for training camp in September? It's been good. Just at the facility every day, getting familiar with the staff, building relationships and working hard. That's really it. I've been having a lot of fun up there and meeting the guys and just building relationships with not only the, the new staff, but the players that are there. That's awesome, man. So we were just talking off air a moment ago about Atlanta and some of the awesome sites and parks that can be found in the city since uh, both you and my fiance are from there. But now that you're in Los Angeles now, have you had a, have you had a chance to check out like any cool spots or eat any good food? Yeah, so last night, I actually just had I believe it was called Gourmet Taco. It was right mm. off of Melrose. I had, I mean, obviously it was Tuesday, so I tried to find some Mexican food. And I had a torta, like a torta sandwich. And it had like, it was like steak, tomatoes, guacamole. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was on a brioche bun. And I had like chicken tacos with it. That was really good. Me and my dad, we've hiked Rangan Canyon and we got to see the city together, like from, from the top of the hill together. I have been to the Peterson Museum with my father. That's actually really cool. What else have I done? I have visited a friend that's staying up in the hills and saw the view from his, his, his house, which is very beautiful. And then I've been to Santa Monica. So I, I've, I've done a few tourist things and I'm never I'm never really bored out here. I was going to say that you are doing Los Angeles right and a lot of Los Angeles fans are going to love what you said because it's all about tacos, going to Santa Monica, uh doing a hike, you went to a museum, you pretty much did the whole you, you you did the whole LA tourist thing. So I think you're doing things right. My my next suggestion for you Quincy would be to uh Check out Koreatown. Check out uh, LA has some mm. really good Asian food. So if you want okay. Korean, Chinese, Filipino, Thai, check out Koreatown. Get some good Korean Korea barbecue. Um, there's but, a spot yeah, I got a, there. I got a whole little list. Oh LA shoot! Style. There you go. I'm, I'm just there, I just added it to my list. There's a spot there called Moon. It's M U N. Has really good Korean barbecue. Really kind of fancy Korean barbecue. But uh, I think I think you'll dig it if you like uh, tacos. Um, yeah. But with that said, let's turn our attention now to basketball and specifically your game, Quincy. And why don't we start here? I want to focus on the Lakers' final Vegas Summer League game versus the Bulls. Mm -hmm. So leading up to that game, you had been getting limited playing time up until that point. You're getting like 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Ironically, I think your best game up until that point was your game against the Atlanta Hawks when you had like six points. Um, but overall, it was it was kind of hard for you to really find a rhythm because of the uneven playing time, I'm sure. But then that final game, it seemed like the light bulb came on. You came off the bench and you had your quintessential Quincy Olivari Peter <laughs> game. 20 points, 6 of 11 from 3. And I kind of just wanted to get your mindset heading into that game because, you know, knowing that Connect, Bronny, and Maxwell Lewis were all going to be sitting yeah, what was your mentality heading into that game? Were you in sort of that like Eminem, I only got one shot state of mind? Or were you kind of more like, screw it, let me just go down swinging and doing me? No, nah, yeah, it was just definitely just like, this my, is this my time. I've been saying the whole two weeks or two and a half weeks since we left LA for San Francisco that one of these games is going to be my game. Especially like as soon as we got to Vegas, I was like, when we played Atlanta, I remember that day, and shoot around, I just kept saying, like, today going to be my day. And I was with Trent Forrest, and I just kept saying, today going to be my day. Believe that. Believe that. And then it just kept – I just kept that mentality every single game leading up and leading up to the last game. And once the last game came, I said, I mean, there's no other game after this. Dalton's not playing. Bronny's not playing. Max Maxwell's not playing. It's going – this this, this going this, – this is it. I'm going to take the shots. I'm going to play hard. And everything else going to fall where it can. I played hard, and when I got up, when I got my open shots, I shot them. I missed a few. I airballed, I airballed some, but I made the ones that I thought were going to be good, which were all of them, and <laughs> the rest is history. Man, that must have been such a feeling for you and such a validating feeling for you to leave Vegas and go out on that note. Like, 
be transparent with me. Was there any doubt starting to creep in before that point? Or were you just sort of like, at that point, you're in a Zen state, come what may? No, yeah, I was like, at that point, I was, I was, I was just excited. I was very thankful for the opportunity to begin with. And I chose the Lakers for a reason based on the options I had coming after night one of the draft. And when things were looking all good before I got to summer league, I was excited. Like I'm going to play for the Lakers. I'm going to be happy. And once I'm in the midst of it, I'm not playing. I kept reminding everyone around me that I can't question my decision or God's God's path for me. Once it gets hard, when I was all happy in in the beginning, because once the trials and tribulations came, the minute I started to doubt him shows the trust I don't have in him. So I trusted him when I made the decision. I got to trust him while I'm in the storm. And at the end, it, it all came to fruition. Every, everything that I thought would happen happened. I, I, I can you can ask any anybody there. I kept saying the minute I get in, that one of these get one of these days, I'm gonna have 20 points and and I'm I'm gonna show y'all. Like I'm gonna show y'all that I, I'm here for a reason. One of these games, and it just so happened to be the very last game. So God's timing is always perfect, right? You know, that is a very yeah. uh mature perspective that you took on and it you know it paid off and you know you saw it come to fruition at the end so I'm very happy for you um after summer league wrapped was there any feedback that the coaches had for you with regards to things that they really liked out of your summer league or your game and then things that they wanted you to keep working on nah they they were just happy that we ended three in a row and they were happy that I I got an opportunity I told them like after we played the Rockets they were like like kidding, getting the travel plans together for people or like what they want to do after summer league, because obviously we could have went home. We could have gone anywhere. They just wanted to figure out where they were scheduling flights. And I looked at Ed in the a face. I was like, I want to go back to LA. Like I want to <laughs> stay at the facility. It's nothing, 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 nothing better to do. The facility has a weight room. It has a kitchen. It got the gym. It got the recovery room. What more could I possibly need right now? So I, they didn't really give me feedback, but I made it clear before summer league was close to being done that after summer league, I planned on staying in LA, being at the facility every day, and that's where I've been since since the draft. Honestly, I mean, I came out there for summer league, and we went to San Francisco, went to Vegas, and I took two days off after summer league, and I've been at it since. That's awesome, man. You are really soaking up Los Angeles in every way, and I hope that it continues to pay off for you as training camp starts. Last summer league question for you. Um, on the Lakers summer league squad, who would you say had the best three point shot besides you? So including yourself, who else? Un I'm unable say? to, I'm unable to answer that question, man. Okay. You're <laughs> unable to answer that. Okay. How about this? Was there anyone else besides you that impressed you in, in practice during shooting drills where you were like, Oh, he has a nice stroke. No, nah, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, obviously the obvious answer is Blake Henson, you know, the first mm -hmm. game in, in San Francisco, I think he was six for eight. Mm -hmm. uh, from three. So that respect to him. I mean, I, I'm, I'm obviously joking. I'm always say, I think I'm the best shooter. You know, that's, sure. that's just who I am. That's, that's how every basketball player should be. But in a, in a mature answer, definitely Blake, Blake, Blake can shoot the ball. And, and we were, we would be in practice and he'd be on my team. And let's say we needed a, a, a needed a three and I couldn't get it off. And we just threw it to Blake at half court. He was going to shoot it and he would, he would make it from time to time. And, it was it was it was it was a it was fun to see because it was like he just gonna shoot it and just say f it get it up and if he make it let's go if he miss it he he probably gonna make the next one that's awesome you you and blake definitely put on a show that last game and you guys kind of have the same mentality when it comes to shooting like if you miss a shot just flush it down the toilet and you know take the next shot with confidence and so Speaking about your three-point shooting, uh, during your Lakers Nation interview with Trevor Lane, I heard you talk about how you taught yourself how to shoot and how you studied J.J. Reddick's better basketball videos growing up. And for me, when I was looking at your tape, the biggest thing that stood out to me about your three-point shooting is kind of how good you are off the ball, coming off screens, but also how good you are on the ball as well, just pulling up off your own dribble. What do you, what do you, what would you say comes the most naturally to you? That sort of like Julio Jones type of off ball route running you do to get free or the I'm in my bag, Jamal Crawford, dribble, dribble, pull up. Well, it's, it's funny you use Julio Jones because as a Falcons fan, that's my favorite, yeah. favorite wide receiver of all time. I, I would answer that question and say, 
coming off screens. I think running off screens, it gives you so much creativity, running, dealing with pace and the threat of wrapping and getting to the basket makes you so much more of a threat. I think when you get in your bag, sometimes it's, it's like, okay, most times you're going to shoot a three. So they kind of play the three, but when you're running off screens, your creativity to stop, have a run into your bag, then push off of that or stop, push them a little bit. They go under the screen and you, you kind of flare back out. It's, it's the creativity of running off of a screen. Mm. It is, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, but to, to, to an entertain someone who's watching basketball for entertainment, seeing a tween cross, hezzy tween, you know, that, that's, that's definitely entertaining, but that I'd rather run off a screen than, than, than dribble the ball. Well, you have, you know, your audience Quincy, because, you know, on the Lakers, they already have a lot of on ball primary creators. And so what they need are movement three point shooters who know their role. And given, given that you studied JJ Reddick's better basketball growing up, did you also, I, I know, obviously you studied his shooting form, but did you also study, especially once he got to the NBA, the way that he would come off screens and, you know, flare out and all that stuff. Did you implement that type of stuff into your game? I would say that part, I kind of give credit to my, my late trainer, Emery Walton. He taught me the footwork of inside foot. So one, two, those type of things. And he taught me a lot of the footwork because as a kid, kind of just kind of just running into it. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to study footwork at 13 years old when they're in an NBA game running super fast, but he slowed it down for me and helped, helped me with that. I actually recently, ironically, I recently just asked JJ, I think it was Tuesday, or it might have been Monday. I asked him about his footwork coming off screens. Which one does he prefer? And he broke it down to me that if there's a big nearby and he doesn't want to kind of run into the big, give himself space, he might one, two and after the screen. But if he's trying to create separation off of the screen, he's going to run through the ball and create create distance. So it it with him, he taught me just – it's all a feeling situation about mm-hmm. how what footwork you're using coming off screens. But – I definitely say the footwork I learned from my AAU coach. That's awesome. And that's that's music to Lakers fans' ears. When I was watching your tape, I was so impressed by the way that you would, you know, run run towards the baseline and then hard pivot and reverse pivot the other way. That, and clear that, was, that out. was our play. That was our play. If we, if we needed a bucket or we needed to get me going, I'm not going to say the play on here just in case Coach Miller wants to run it again. And the way he would word it was very, very genius. And I will never, ever, ever forget that. If I ever coach in my life, I will do the exact same thing he did. And I will not spill the secret. But that was the play. If we needed to get me going, if we needed a three or a bucket, we were running that exact play. And that play got got it, it got me open. If I missed it, it was a good shot. If I made it, that's all I needed to see. And it was over. That's awesome. And that's and that's kind of why I compare it to like an elite wide receiver, you know, just that ability to stop on a dime and then all of a sudden sprint out the other way. Like you always got defenders heads turned like the other way. So that's really awesome to hear. Now, with regards to how you get your three point shot off, the other thing that was insane to me about your three point shot was that rainbow arc of yours. Like, did you did you develop that over time or was that always how you shot because you had to learn to get your shot off? off taller defenders because it, it the, it's funny because when I was kind of chopping up your clips to my video, it kind of frustrated me how long your clips were because the you'd shoot it and then it would still be three seconds to get into the basket. And I'd be like, oh, I already said what I needed to say. I need faster, like snappy clips. But Quincy's shots, like take you take up the whole video clip, for, if, if that makes any sense. I was like, man, this ball is taking a long time to get into the hoop. But it's just amazing how how much arc you're able to put on that. Was that something that you sort of developed to, I mean, you shoot it quick, but was that something that you sort of developed over time or something you, that's always how you shot? I, I would say it's always how I shot because I was always the short, shorter, shorter kid on the floor and I was scared of contact. So I'll just kind of like push it up to kind of get it up, get it out quick. And then as I got older, I realized higher art gives it and a softer shot gives it more chance to play with the rim. And I've always just, as I've gotten older, I've just looked at people's shot. And the first thing I always notice is their art, like, ah, uh, they're, they're, they need more art because it's so flat. So it has to be perfect. And, and if it's perfect, it'll go in a certain way, but if it's not perfect, it's a hard miss. And it'll, bang, it'll bounce this way, bounce this way. But if you shoot it up and you shoot it soft, you might hit back, you might hit back rim. And even if it's not perfect, it'll still go in. You might hit front of rim and it might bounce in and you might hit side of rim. 
but having a higher arc allows for a softer make and allows for more room for air if it's not a perfect a perfect shot. And I think I think if you look sometimes at sometimes Steph Curry's shot, like the shot he made against Paris to seal the game when he was fading, he shot it up. As yep. he's fading away, he shoots it higher because it gives it gives the ball and your shot a little bit more room for error if it's not perfect. And I, I've tried to carry that with every shot I shoot because not every shot's going to be perfect, but if you can get it just the right amount of arc on it, it'll be a softer mate. It'll it'll allow you to make it even if it's not an exact swish. And it's 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 harder to block. No, for sure. It's a very effective shot. Not as effective if you want to chop up a bunch of clips and make it happen. <laughs> and she, and she, I, want, I wanted to show five of your shooting clips, but I was like, oh, I can only show two because this is taking so long. But it's very effective in-game. Now, with regards to your overall game, what would you say is your superpower or your superpowers if you could pinpoint one? Like D'Angelo Russell last year, for example highlighted his uncanny ability to just get hot or go on heaters as his quote unquote superpower and something that he could always do ever since high school. You know, some other players may highlight their hustle and motor, but for you, what would you say is one of your superpowers as a basketball player? Oh, I, I, I never really accepted this until maybe my senior year at Rice, but being a microwave scorer, mm. I think, I have been credited with the ability to just go on run, scoring runs by myself. And I was talking to a coach that we used to play against at North Texas. And he said that we never wanted you to get hot because if you got hot, the game was over. You could mm-hmm. go on a 10 score scoring run. You could make a bucket. We would make sure we called a timeout as soon as you made one bucket, because if you started to get hot, you could run off a bunch of points in a small amount of time. And it would take the game from here to here. And as I started to notice that, I've had a couple games. Like, I remember when we played DePaul the second time at Xavier, and at halftime I had, like, four points. And before the media, I had, like, 16 points. And I just looked up and was like, that was quick, you know. And I I, I never really tried to accept that because I feel like I understand that I I am not just someone you can get a ball to. It's automatically a bucket. Like I I, I know that I struggle sometimes to get open or st- struggle to score the ball against some defenders, and I I, I don't really want to accept it because I feel like it's a it's a cocky cocky way of walking walking the basketball world. But the the amount of times I've gotten the compliment, I have to at least show respect to it. But I I I like to take pride in my energy, like how mm-hmm. how how I how I approach the game and how every game I always hear that I look like I'm having fun and how, how I just like to crash the re- crash the glass. I love to rebound. Yeah. I love, no, that, I love to rebound. That is it. That that's the next point I was going to get to, but that's awesome that you were able to sort of embrace that microwave score role uh, that people were giving you. And it's, it's even more awesome that you were able to showcase that in the final game of the summer league. Cause I'm sure some people saw that who are not familiar with your game and were like, uh, maybe that's just sort of like a fluky game, but that's actually, no, that's part of your DNA as a basketball player. So that's awesome that you're able to actually showcase that. Now, with regards to crashing the glass, the other thing that I was most impressed by with your game was just like your body frame and physicality. Um, that I want to, so yeah, I want to focus on that gritty physical side of your game. You're only like six two, six three, but you seem to play a lot bigger. Um, was that something that you were conscientious about growing up in high school where you were like, yeah, I'm short. How do I get an edge in another way? Because I was like, man, you are super, you're super bulky and built. And I I was wondering like, does that affect your shot at all? Being that sort of big as a small point guard. I do know that what it did help you do was that, like you mentioned, like you, you like to crash the glass as a six, three guard averaging like 5.6 rebounds, five to six rebounds every year in college. I was like, oh, this dude really goes after it and he knows how to get into position and really grab it from other defenders. So talk to me a little bit about your game. And also, I guess, what is it? it, it you're, you're nodding your head just now. So it doesn't sound like it was a conscientious effort for you to bulk up. But yeah, tell me how you no. got to this point of being such a such a physical guard. I used to be scared of contact growing up. I would Every time the shot went up, I would just sprint down to the corner and just sit in the corner waiting on the ball. And my whole thought process changed when my uncle slash mentor, his name is Andrew Doyley in Atlanta. He uh, works with me and Chase Hunter. We grew up, me and Chase grew up together in Atlanta. And he he looked me in the eye and he was like, Q, if you want the ball, 
go rebound because if you get the rebound, you don't have to ask, ask for the ball from nobody because you already got it. And I feel like I'm, I, 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 I'm fast. I think I'm fast. Mm-hmm. And so it was a few clips at Rice where I would get it off the glass and I would just beat everybody down the floor and lay the ball up. And I was like, oh, that's fun. Like, this is fun to just get it and just race everybody else down the floor. And either get a foul or lay the ball up. And next thing you know, they still jogging back on defense, do it again. Next thing you know, they tired. And it, it just kind of came with me wanting to push myself to get stronger. And the weight just kind of increased and increased. And my mom would just kind of say, like, oh, your shoulders are bigger and you look stronger <laughs> and things like that. Just wanting to get stronger. And then my shoulders, they protected me. You know, I got this scar right here on my shoulder. Uh, I got hit by a car oh, and I was like, like my shoulder, like destroyed the windshield. I just remember thinking like, dog, like <laughs> I got to keep these shoulders because if I can do that to a windshield, imagine what I can do to a defender. And it just be kind of came a conscious effort to just, when I'm in the weight room, just always push myself, go heavy, get, get, get more weight, go harder. And once I got a Xavier with coach Kettler and he just pushed, pushed me to another level in the weight room, I was like 199, 200, and I'm still 4%. I've been – my body fat percentage since I've been tracking it in high school has always been between 4 and 5, like between 4% and 5%. And I, I've always still felt fast. And once the shoulders kind of became something that people said is an important thing to have, I just always tried to have maintain a conscious effort to maintain those. Yeah, that, 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 that's awesome. And, and very wise words to live by. If you want the ball, go and get it yourself. And that's what you did all throughout college. And then the other thing that I was very impressed by was just your ability to absorb contact and get to the free throw line. And, you know, that's that's one thing that the Lakers lacked the last couple of seasons, just sort of that physicality at the guard position and someone, a guard who can actually fight for boards and, and get after it himself. So that's a quality that I think Lakers fans are really going to gravitate towards with regards to your game defensively, what do you think you can bring to the table? Because outside of you being pretty bulky, you also have a long six, seven wingspan. And in college, you really love like jumping into passing lanes and like using your speed to really leak out the other way and taking it to the house. Like, what would you say are your strengths defensively? My conditioning, number one, I used to run cross country. So, Mm -hmm. and like I did it just because I wanted to. It wasn't like one of those things that people on the basketball team had to do. Like I ran cross country from when I was like 11 12 and I stopped when I was 16 so I could just do full-time basketball but definitely my conditioning and my physicality like I'm I when I'm playing defense I'm very handsy like I I do I try to guard the ball the way I hate to be guarded you Mm -hmm. know so I'm I might I might kind of touch you on your hip a lot or I might just slap at the ball and you know hit your wrist from time to time I'll take a foul here and there because I get at college I got five of them NBA I got six and summer league you get 10 so I'll take a file here and there, but physicality and conditioning, I think is something that I can bring to the team. I know for sure conditioning is, is something that I hold to a high standard because I, I ran cross country and I don't want to, I, the feeling of being out of shape, like those first few days when you come back from summer break or just taking a, taking a, a break that's necessary are the worst. So maintaining maintaining condition is important to me and I think being a defender like I showed in summer league that picks up full court you got to be in the best shape yeah no we we love scrappy guys who go after it go after the loose balls get those 50 50 balls and the fact that you have a high energy motor I think is going to take you a long way whether it's with the Lakers or the South Bay Lakers um What are some aspects of your game as we round out here that you're still trying to refine and work on after your summer league experience and heading into training camp? Playmaking, for sure. You can never be too smart with the ball in your hand. So even if I become in some some world a Rajon Rondo type of point guard where I'm just dropping dimes left and right, you can still never never learn too much about the game and have have reads. I, I, I I would definitely, without a doubt, say playmaking for sure. Nice. And I think that's perfect because you have such gravity to you, especially when you drive into the lane. You're so quick that if you're able to also to kick it out to your open teammates because of all the attention that you draw, I think that's that's a perfect way to round out your game. Um, Here's a fun question. I know you said you've been in the facility a lot this offseason, and I'm sure you've competed with some of the with some of the actual Lakers players on the team. Who on the Lakers this year, besides Anthony Davis and LeBron James, of course, are you 
excited about competing against that you haven't necessarily seen in training camp yet? Or maybe it's someone that you have seen in training camp. Was there someone that you were kind of, you know, just as a fan, you were really looking forward to competing against before you got here? I wouldn't even say a fan. I would just say more situational. It's definitely Austin Reeves. He's mm. in a similar position as me, Exhibit 10 deal, chose the Lakers because he wanted to be here and worked his way up. So just just kind of being there as a sponge to to learn from him, compete with him. It's kind of similar to what I did my freshman year of high school, just people that I looked up to and were in positions that I want to be in and learn from. I just competed with them every day and learned from them. And it, it, it helped me become the player I was in high school and carry me this far in my journey. So I would definitely say Austin Reeves because he can really shoot the ball. He can, he can make great reads off the pick and roll. I, I read a stat that he led the Lakers in most assists to LeBron. I believe mm -hmm. it, it was something along those lines, but just, just compete against him. He can really shoot the ball. We talk every day I mean, he knows my name. So every, every time I see him, you know, we just, we chop it up and I would, I would definitely just say Austin Reeves. I also just learned yesterday that his birthday is two days after mine. So, oh shoot! It's it's pretty crazy, but just I would say Austin Reeves without a doubt, just because of situation and uh, what what he did to get there is is the journey. I'm, it looks like I, I'll have to take also. No, totally. Austin Reeves is the perfect type of player to sort of follow with regards to trajectory, and then you know another former Laker that fans have grown to love is Alex Caruso, right? You guys are all on that same sort of undrafted free agent journey, and through hard work and determination were able to find your way. Um, last question for you, or one of the last questions is, do you have a player comp for yourself at the next level or a player type that you like to pattern your, your game after? In my video, I comp you to guys like Bones Highland or, or Lou Williams, but I'm curious to see who you see yourself as. So going into pre-draft, uh, understanding role, I, was, I said Seth Curry, the way he ran off, came off screens mm -hmm. and 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 uh, shot the ball. But I also kind of wanted to make sure that I emphasized how how I how much I care about defense because I think that's a knock that mm -hmm. I get it. I don't care about defense, and I I don't I don't really I like to prove people wrong with that. As I've as I've gone through pre draft. It was I, a lot of teams said I should start saying more like a Tyrese Maxey, a scoring point guard mm -hmm. that can still play make with the ball in his hands and is a scoring threat, but still able to come off screens, make good reads, put people in position to score. And then recently, as I've been talking to more people inside the, the NBA world, I've gotten a, a few Isaiah joke comparisons. Mm -hmm. So like it, it's, it's kind of bounced around. But it started at Seth Curry. Then I, I started I started saying like Seth Curry, but when it comes to defense, more like a Gabe Vincent who can still shoot and still known for his toughness in defense. And then a couple of teams said Tyrese Maxey. And then as I've gotten into the NBA world, a few teams have said Isaiah Joe. So it kind of bounces around, but I just wanted to be clear that it's not – I'm not walking in here saying my player comp is Steph Curry or <laughs> Anthony Edwards or, you know, I'm very, very, I think I could be a role similar to what Devin Booker played in Team USA. Sure. Defender and an efficient scorer that doesn't require the ball and to, to uh, take away from the offense. And I think, I think that's the beauty of your game. You're, you have like a versatile do whatever it takes sort of game where you could be on one night sort of like Davion Mitchell, lock the guy down, shoot some threes without the ball or like, you know, Lou Dordish. And then another night, you know, if, if a defensive play or if a defensive play breaks down and the team needs a bucket, they're like, give it to Quincy, let him create something out of nothing. You can also do that too. So I, when I was chopping up your tape, I was like, oh man, the way you're running off screens, you look like a movement shooter like Seth Curry or Landry Shamit or something like that. And then when I see with the ball, you know, scoring 43 points against DePaul, I'm like, okay, this looks more like, yeah, like to your point, Tyrese Maxey, uh, Cam Thomas, someone who's got that you know, on ball creation juice. And I was like, yeah, this is going to serve you very well because you know how to do the basics. But if you ever need, need to sort of tear up or level up and, you know, you get more of that trust from the coaches or your teammates, you can also do stuff with the ball as well. So like, I, I just love the way that you're able to teeter back and forth with regards to being sort of like 
an ancillary player or also a go-to guy microwave scorer off the bench as well. So last question for you, Quincy, you seem like a really grounded player with a good head on your shoulders. Who's very humble for someone who has achieved the accolades you have at every level from, you know, being number two in scoring in the big, big East last season to breaking the single season three point record at Xavier. Um, your ability to stay humble and maintain the perspective you do is, is, I feel like such a great quality that I think will serve you well at the next level. So now that you've finished your first summer league and checked off that milestone with style, how are you attacking the start of training camp? Was there anything from how you approach summer league or anything that you learned from summer league that you'll be carrying with you as you gear up for training camp and the start of the season with the Lakers and the South Bay Lakers? It's always it's always another another goal to check off, just because I scored twenty. We weren't we weren't playing in the championship, like that. That's like a that's like something like okay, I scored twenty, but we weren't playing in the championship. Or yeah, I had all these accolades in college, but the reason I left Rice was to play in the tournament. So it it just it kind of keeps me grounded because I complete these goals, but it's always something else to chase. And I take time to celebrate. Like, yeah, I took time with my family to and my agent to just say, man, like first summer league, play, play with the Lakers jersey on, score 20 in summer league. And that was cool. But like I said, two days later, I'm back to work. And I'm attacking these workouts in the training camp every day. Um, I want a contract. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to come in here and prove that I can play at this level, but not only play at this level, that I can stand out among these guys that have these contracts and I can, I can be in the same group with Dalton and Bronny and all these other guards on, on your staff and not, not look like the odd man out because I'm not on the contract. Like I fit right in with these same guys. So it's, it's just always a mindset that there's something else to chase. I want, I want a contract. I want to, I want to be able to say that the Lakers signed me to a contract, not, Oh yeah, I'm on an exhibit ten deal. I'm I'm on a train. I, no, I play for the Lakers. Like, mm. okay, well, you play for the Lakers. Well, yes. Now I'm I am in rotation for the Lakers, or now I am in the starting. Like, it's just it's always something I'm. It's always another goal that I'm chasing that just keeps me focused on whatever whatever task I'm 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 trying to complete. For like, sure, with for school, sure. Like with school, like I'm at Xavier. I did all the basketball, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm chasing this degree. I'm one class away from a degree. Like. Okay, now I'm I'm through with Xavier. Now, once you graduate from inner school, you can, I mean, I'm not saying I am, but you can get your, your jersey retired. You can, it's it's a lot more things that you can then chase because you have a degree that that you wouldn't be able to have if if you don't. So I'm just always chasing something, something greater than the last thing I just accomplished. Definitely. And I'm and I'm glad that you're able to keep perspective through each milestone that you hit. You're never too high, you're never too low, you're very realistic about things, but at the same time, you know that you can trust yourself in the one thing that you've always done well your entire life, which is just to work hard, right? And so I hope whatever you continue to achieve along the way, you never sort of lose that passion and joy along the way, you know, because they, you know, as most people say, it, it is about the process and the journey. And so if sometimes if you if you put your head down too hard, and you don't take those moments to celebrate, you get lost in it, and you don't have fun anymore, Thanks. you know, Thanks. so I'm glad that you were able to, to, use that perspective, even, you know, with summer league, 20 points, let's celebrate. Now let's get back to work. And I hope that continues on in training camp as well, where it's like, oh, shoot, just had a good training session. Now let's get back to work. It's preseason now, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're with the South Bay Lakers. And so, yeah, I think that's just a, a really good mindset to have. And in my video, I manifested it for you, Quincy. I, I said that at some point you're going to nab one of LA's two two way spots this season, and we're really rooting for you to do that. So it's going to start with a two way spot. I hope then it turns into a standard contract. And like you mentioned, I hope we can one day call you a legitimate Los Angeles Laker. But as far as I'm concerned right now, I'm talking to a legitimate Los Angeles Laker. You got the shirt on. You're about to be in training camp, and I hope you kill it. So thank you so much for hopping on the Lakers legacy podcast. It was an absolute pleasure being able to chop it up with you about your game and just sort of your journey in general, best of luck in training camp and with the South Bay Lakers this next season. And before training camp hits, please go get some Korean barbecue and, and check out some good <laughs> Asian food. LA has good Asian food. I'll say that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me.
Absolutely. Thank you.